Welcome AP Electricity and Magnetism students. Today's topic is Gauss's Law. Here is just an outline of what we're going to be talking about today, the, Gauss, the concept behind Gauss's Law, and then we're going to look at analyzing different symmetries for uh, using Gauss's Law for these different symmetries, cylindrical, spherical, and planar. You don't have to write these down, they're what's coming in the notes. But I want to just say some general remarks about Gauss's Law. So, in the last review lesson, we looked at finding the electric field using the methods of distributed charge, direct integration of E equals KQ over R squared. We found that for like a wire segment or um, an arc of charge or a ring of charge or a disk, the techniques were very heavy in calculus very difficult visualizing these components, integrating, and you actually had to do integration to get those electric fields. Now, that is not very likely, it turns out, to show up on the AP test free response portion of the test. What's much more common is Gauss's Law. So, as I've said many times, you can, but what you should be doing when you're studying is prioritizing the topics. Don't spend time and energy on things that are not very likely to be on the test. So if you felt that yesterday's information or the distributed charge information was confusing and you're likely never to understand that to the full extent uh, possible, then you might make a valid decision of skipping that in your studies and concentrating on other things. Like, for example, Gauss's Law. This is very likely to be on the free response. Probably, if I were to guess, be like 70 to 80 percent likely to see a, free a whole free response question devoted to Gauss's Law. This you don't want to skip. Gauss's Law you want to devote full energy to, to try and understand uh, the topic as best you can. But again, you don't look at all the difficult, most difficult problems within Gauss's Law, even within Gauss's Law, you want to just look at the big ideas and look at the most common kinds of problems that show up. And if a curveball question comes up, well, we can't prepare for all of those. So we do our best by just focusing on the big ideas. That's what I'm going to do today. Just look at some examples of likely uh, kinds of analyses that will show up. All right, that being said, let us begin. Okay. So. Here we are. So we begin, I'm going to begin with first the concept of Gauss's Law. Again, this is most commonly used to determine the electric field. And as you may recall, you often are able to find the electric field by technically not even integrating at all. And it's an easier way to find electric field than the stuff we learned in the distributed charge unit. Okay, so that's the first point, finding electric field. But what is the concept? How does this equation, what does it mean? How does it work? So, uh, it says that the electric field integrated over an area, into or out of an area, a closed area, the flux, in other words, is equal to the charge enclosed, the net charge enclosed in that surface over epsilon zero. And before I go into that in more detail, I want to just point out what I've said before when we were studying Gauss's Law, that everything in this equation is important. Omit any symbol. It may look like, oh, what's the big deal? I'm not going to put little vector signs over the E and the DA. Or I'm not going to put that circle in the integral. Leaving that off changes the mathematical meaning of that sentence radically. Math has rules, just like the English language has rules very specific rules of grammar. Math has a grammar too. An example I use when we're studying this at the time is an English sentence if I were to say let's eat grandma with no comma. What I'm basically saying is I want to eat my grandmother. If I say let's eat comma grandma I am inviting my grandmother to lunch. So you see that little comma, oh, what's the big deal? Just a little, little line, right? It radically changes the meaning. Same thing mathematically. If you leave those little vectors in the dot product off, what you're saying 
is that you're calculating the electric field over integral of electric field over surface and it doesn't matter with whether the electric field runs along the surface or out of the surface. There's no dot product. As long as you have an electric field anywhere on that surface, the direction doesn't matter. You get the same answer for this versus integrating for that, even though the electric fields are in different directions. And that's not what Gauss's law is saying. By putting those dot products there, you're saying the electric field or flux going into or out of the box because, as I mentioned when we studied this, the area vector points perpendicular to the surface. So now suddenly if I say the dot product between area and electric field, them being 90 degrees to each other here, is zero. So then when I put those vector signs dot product, the answer of that integral is zero here. But not here because we have electric area this way and electric field that way parallel to each other. The dot product is EDA. So it's not, it's one times those and you integrate and you get an answer there, non-zero. That electric field, obviously if we've got a net positive charge in here, the flux is going to be coming out. Okay. Whereas if we have a net negative charge here, the electric field arrows are going to be pointing in and you'll get a negative here. That means the flux has to be negative. We've got electric field coming in. So it makes sense in terms of what we uh, studied earlier about electric field and, and just what we understand about it. The next point I want to make in terms of the concepts behind Gauss's law is you have to pick a closed surface. That's what that little circle means. So for example, a sphere, okay, I can't get to the center of the sphere without poking a hole through that surface. So that's what that circle means. It doesn't mean like a circle, like if I cut it out of a piece of paper. No, it's got to be closed in. It has to block some space off from the rest of the universe. It could be a cylinder, okay, again, I can't get to the center of this wood without poking through that surface. Or it could be a box or any other shape. And this expression is true. However, we can't just pick any shape we want when we're using Gauss's law to solve problems. We have to pick a shape that makes sense for the particular geometry that we have. Take, for instance, a proton. Electric field spreads out away from it. And let's suppose I say, all right, I want to use Gauss's law to find the electric field on a proton. I'm going to enclose it in a cylinder. Again, that statement is true for the cylinder but it does not give me a convenient way to find electric field. Because if you look at the electric field, you can see that it points away from the proton. And so it does not line up with the surface. The dot product is different at all of these points because there are different angles involved. Furthermore, the electric field arrows are all different lengths because this is closer to the proton than this point over here. So we have a, so we've got multiple electric fields, all different directions. So this is true, but it is not useful for finding the electric field of a proton. What the cylinder is useful for is a long line of charge, like a wire charged up. Okay. It has to be infinitely long again, infinite in quotes. I mentioned this when we studied, all throughout the year, the concept of infinity in science is relative. Okay, so an infinitely long wire doesn't have to stretch to the outer reaches of the universe. It could be stretching from one side of the room to the next, just across one room. And as long as we stay near the vicinity, the center uh, of the wire, in a given 10 centimeters from the center, for those dimensions, the wire pretty much behaves as, a, as a, the same as, as if the wire stretched to outer space. Okay, so infinity doesn't have to be true infinity. It's relative to the geometry or the scale involved in the problem. So I surround the wire with a cylinder. Now, you still need to understand distributed charge, the methods in that topic, to understand why the cylinder will work to find the electric field around that infinite wire. If I take a portion of the wire right here, 
and this is a positive wire, it will make an electric field pointed like that directly away from that point. If I go the same distance to the right over here and find a point here, it makes an electric field like that. The horizontal components of those two arrows cancel. I know that the electric field, if the wire behaves as infinite, will point directly away from the wire. Furthermore, it'll be a constant all along this cylinder surface. Right? All along there because all of these are equal distance from the wire. So knowing that, I know that the, uh, I could use that to find an electric field because basically then, let me see, this up a little bit. Okay, so I start with Gauss's law, I wrote Q enclosed over epsilon zero first over here. The Q enclosed will be the charge inside of our cylinder right here, which is the charge density, the coulombs per meter, times the meters of the wire inside our Gaussian uh, cylinder. Coulombs per meter times meter gives us the coulombs inside. So this is Q enclosed over epsilon zero. Now, the flux, okay, is only through the outer edge of the cylinder, this portion, right? Not the ends, because the electric field runs along these surfaces. It doesn't come in or out. So the flux through the ends is zero and zero, through this end and that end. But the electric field, the dot product here is one, so we remove the vector symbols because we already performed the dot product. The electric field points perfectly out, aligned with the area vector. Furthermore, it's a constant, so we could take it out of the integral. So we're just integrating dA, which gives us the area of this outer edge of the cylinder, which again, as I mentioned when we were studying Gauss's law, can open up into a rectangle. 2 pi r is that dimension times the length of the cylinder, right? So this is the length of the cylinder times 2 pi r. That's that, 2 pi r l. And then we solve for electric field by dividing both sides by 2 pi r l. And here's our answer. Another thing I want to point out is something I said many times, I'll say it throughout this review lesson, is that when you get your answer, if you have the time, it's worthwhile to do a unit check on this Remember that from E equals KQ over R squared, the electric field is K coulombs per meter squared, KQ over R squared. So 1 over 2 pi epsilon 0 has the same units as K, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So there's our K. The ep when we have a 1 divided by epsilon 0, that satisfies the units of K. Lambda is in coulombs per meter. And then we divide by radius meter. That gives us K coulombs per meter squared, this formula has the right form. Again, if I lost that 2 somewhere along the way, this method will not catch that mistake of dropping out constants or adding constants, but certainly if for whatever reason I had an r squared here, I would catch that and say, wait a minute, something's wrong, I could go back and look for a correction. So this just, I showed you just to show you the, in detail, the concepts behind how Gauss's law works, the mechanics of the calculus on, with that integral. But now we're going to look at more specific problems. Okay, so okay, so here we move on to first cylindrical sym symmetry. Again, we're looking today at the highlights of the problem solving. What you're going to see from here on out is going to be less detail than you need to get full credit on an AP test. I just want to focus in, zero in, on where the thinking is done in the solution. So what we have here is a solid cylinder with a charge density rho filling the whole cylinder and it's very long. It goes, you know, infinitely in either direction. And it has a radius of capital R. Okay. So Suppose I want to find the electric field inside the cylinder, inside the charged material. So for R less than R within the cylinder. So I have to first think of an appropriate Gaussian surface. I can't pick a box because of the symmetry inherent in the problem. I need to pick a cylinder. So I sketch the Gaussian cylinder inside here, within, because I want to find for electric field 
smaller than capital R. So the first thing I have to do is write out Gauss's law when I solve the problem. Okay, but again, we're not going to get bogged down in details. I want this sheet to be very dense with just the thinking involved here. So I skipped writing out Gauss's law. So the EDA just becomes E times area of the outer edge of the cylinder. The outer edge of the cylinder, as I explained in this portion over here, over here with this solution, is E times 2 pi RL. That will be the same on the left side, all for cylindrical symmetry. Okay, through all the cylindrical symmetry problems, the left side just becomes E times 2 pi RL because that's the flux through the outer edge of that cylinder. Okay, the Q enclosed is rho times volume. Rho is coulombs per meter cubed, so we multiply by the meter cubed or the volume of that Gaussian cylinder. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared, the area of the end, times the length, so it's area times height of a cylinder, 2 pi r, I mean pi r squared l over epsilon zero. Now generally I don't, uh, today I won't be um, solving, I'll just set this up for the various geometries only occasionally. The reason why I solved for the electric field inside is I want to once more show you an example of how you can analyze the units to figure out that this formula has the right form. We have our 1 over epsilon 0 which is which gives us the units of k in kq over r squared. Rho is in coulombs per meter cubed and then r is in meters and you can see that when I multiply this out I get k coulombs over meters squared. So this has the right form. Again Maybe I lost a pi, maybe a pi belongs there. I can't catch that mistake using that method, but I can catch maybe if I had r squared here. I'd say, oh, wait a minute, something's wrong. Okay, so there's the electric field inside. How about the electric field outside? So what I need is a cylinder that's going to enclose, go out, be outside the, um, the Gaussian cylinders outside the cylinder that has the charge in it like this because I want to find the electric field here. So there's the shaded region electric field there. Again, I skipped writing out Gauss's law, but you can't on the AP. You've got to write it out with all the proper signs. The second line in our solution, the electric field outside times the E times area through this surface right here, is going to equal Q enclosed over epsilon zero. Now, this is rho times volume, but not the volume of our Gaussian cylinder. It's the volume of what's enclosed and the charge doesn't extend all the way out to the outer edge of our Gaussian cylinder. It stops at capital R. So I need the volume of the cylinder, not the volume of the Gaussian cylinder, but the charge cylinder. That's why I plug in capital R here, not lowercase r. It's the, vo uh, it's the volume of the charged cylinder. Pi r squared L. And again, I would just solve that for electric field. Now, as you re probably remember, a very popular thing on these free response tests is then to graph the electric field as a function for all the different particular locations. As you could see from this formula, we have a linear relationship between electric field and radius. So at radius zero, we have zero electric field. And then it grows as a straight line. So I do my best to draw a straight line, but as I said in class, I always write proportional to R because this looks a little wavy to me. I didn't do a very good job drawing a straight line. And you don't want the person grading this to say, oh, that person who took this test thinks that it's the electric field function is curved in there. I'm going to take a point off, right, or something like that. So this protects you even if you're a sloppy drawer, which is, you know, I do all right with the drawing, but not perfect. And then out here, it's curved down. I write 1 is proportional to 1 over R, which is what you would find from this formula. Also, very often, they want you to put uh, transition values on the graph. So I could figure out what this value is at the outer edge of the cylinder by either plugging in capital R into this formula or capital R into this formula. Either way, I get this, unless I made a mistake, but it's rho, rho times capital R over 2 epsilon 0. I always write the electric fields with the epsilon zero, 1 over epsilon 0 separate for the unit analysis, but you could write it as one formula, one division.
for, again, full credit is mathematically equivalent. So there's a graph of the electric field for the solid around inside and around the solid cylinder. Okay. Another thing that we often calculate with uh, Gauss's law problems is the voltage or potential caused by these electric fields. Let's suppose, I didn't write it out, but the problem asks for the potential difference between 2R and 0. So here's 0, here's R, here's 2R. I'm looking straight at the cross-section of the cylinder. What you have to realize is that voltage difference between two points, and it always has to be between two points, is the integral, negative integral of electric field dx. Again, we went over why there's a minus sign and the dot product and all that in the last uh, uh, couple less review lessons ago. But what you have to realize is that if you're going to integrate from this point to the origin, you actually have to perform two integrals because there's one electric field expression here and there's another one here. So we can't integrate one expression all the way in because there, aren't, there isn't one expression. There's one for out here and one for out here. So I have to split this integral into two parts. I first start by integrating, oh, uh, oh yeah, I flipped the colors around. This should have been circled in blue, okay, because this is the integral there, and that's the integral there. I'll see if I could fix that uh, when I scan the notes. But basically, I integrate from 2R to R of the electric field out here, dr. And then I stop integrating here because that expression stops here. And I have to start reintegrating with another expression, the electric field inside here, which is that linear one, from R into the origin. R to the origin. Okay? So that's how you uh, figure out the voltage in these Gauss law problems. Very often you've got to do multiple integrals over the different segments. I'm not going to show you the details, plugging in the electric field and integrating and putting in the loop, because again, you want to, we just want to focus on the highlights today so we don't get overwhelmed with too much information. Okay. Also, this is probably going to be at least half credit, just setting this up like this, if they ask it, maybe even more. So the setup is more important than the answer. So that's what we want to focus on, get as many points as we can. Okay, moving on, uh, the hollow pipe. Okay, example two for cylinder. In other words, I have a pipe, okay, and a hole in the center, so this is like air or vacuum or something in here, but this is the charge region, rho, and the charge region starts from capital R radius and ends at capital 2R radius. So it's inside here is where the charge is. So I want to find the electric field in all the regions. One for R less than capital R, in other words, inside the cavity. And so I make a little tiny Gaussian cylinder here. Maybe you can't see it too well, but you'll see it better on the scan notes. And again, the flux through the outside, E times area, 2 pi RL. Again, same as all over here, E 2 pi RL on the left side. But the Q enclosed there is zero. There's no charge inside that Gaussian surface. So we write another line here, E equals zero. Okay, but again, I'm just looking at the setups. Okay, within the charged material, I draw another Gaussian surface like this, within the charged material. Okay, so again, I start by writing out Gauss's law first. Again, I'm skipping all the details, just looking at here where we do most of the thinking. So the flux through this surface, E times area, 2 pi RL is the area there. That's going to equal rho times volume. But this is the volume of the charge, not the volume of the Gaussian cylinder. And the charge is only in the portion that's, uh, you know, where the rho exists. So if I do just pi R squared L, and I don't have this minus term, I'm saying the charge goes all throughout this Gaussian cylinder and that there's no hole in the middle. So what I need to do is account for the fact that there's no charge in the hole. So I subtract off the volume of the hole, which is pi capital R squared, the area of the hole, times the length of our Gaussian cylinder. So volume minus volume is the volume just of the charge over epsilon zero. 
Again, you would simplify, get an answer. We're going to skip that. How about outside the cylinder? Out here, we want to find the electric field. So we got to make a Gaussian surface that's outside the cylinder. So which that's the pink Gaussian surface there, the cylinder. Again, left side, E times area of this outer pink surface. This is Q enclosed rho times volume again. Rho times volume. This is the volume of the entire cylinder, pi r squared L, minus the volume of the hole, pi r squared L. So total volume minus the hole is the volume where the charge is times the charge density gives you Q over epsilon zero. Again, you solve for E outside. The graph would look something like this. I didn't bother figuring out the value that this transition occurs at capital 2R right here, but you would if this were an AP, okay? But it's zero inside, as we saw here. So the inside the hole, there's no electric field. From R to capital 2R, the electric field grows by whatever function we had here, if we were to solve it. Again, you would solve it, you'd see the function goes like that. And then out here, if you look carefully, this is these are all constants, so we're dividing by R, so it's a 1 over R graph outside the cylinder. So that's the graph. If we wanted to find the potential, in other words, the voltage from uh, 3R to the origin, now we would need three separate integrals. We'd have to integrate from here to here, and there are three different expressions. This is from, this, from 3R to 2R, and then from 2R to R, we integrate here. And then from R to 0, we integrate here. Of course, this is 0, right? But I just put it there so you, you realize that it's still there. But you don't have to write that out. If you wrote minus 0 here, that'd be fine. So again, not looking at the details. We're just looking at the ideas, the setups, cylindrical symmetry. Okay? All right, let's move on to spherical symmetry. Okay. So, the first example, we've got a solid sphere represented by the shaded region. It's got a total charge, Q, uniformly distributed within its volume. So I didn't write that out, but that's basically what we're, what we're dealing with here. So, there are two regions, one for radius less than capital R, that means within the sphere itself. So, I created, I realized that since I have a sphere, I need a spherical Gaussian surface. Last time I had a cylinder, I needed a cylindrical Gaussian surface, right? So now sphere. So I make a Gaussian sphere. Again, I'm imagining this in my mind. And I write out Gauss's law for that. For that. So there's my first line of the solution, which we're skipping. We're just looking at the meat of the problem here. This time, instead of E times 4 pi R, uh, sorry, 2 pi RL, which is the area of the outer edge of the cylinder, we want the area of a sphere, the surface area, which is 4 pi r squared. So that you got to remember. In all spherical problems, whether you got shells or whatever, holes or point charges, the left side of Gauss's law always becomes e times 4 pi r squared. Now, how much charge is inside here, inside our Gaussian surface? This is rho times volume. Total charge over total volume gives you the density of the charge. The volume of a sphere, area 4 pi r squared, the volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. You've got to remember that also. So, total charge over total volume gives me the row of this entire sphere. Then I multiply by the 4 pi r cubed, the volume of our Gaussian sphere, and that'll give me the Q, the Coulombs inside of our Gaussian sphere, all over epsilon zero. Again, I don't usually solve in today's notes, but I did solve this one out just so we could practice a unit check again. If I did the algebra correct, this is the expression. So we want to see, is this formula have the right form? 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 actually is k, but any 1 over epsilon 0 gives us the units of k, so we got that, that's good. Then in the top, we've got coulombs times meters divided by meters cubed. And if you look, this simplifies to k q over r squared. So this looks like it's the right form. So we can move on. All right, next, 
How about the electric field outside the sphere for R greater than capital R? So once again, I draw a Gaussian sphere, but this time outside the charge. And then I write Gauss's law out for that, you know, starting my problem. I write that out with all the nice details that are necessary. And then the second line, this left side of the integral just becomes E times area, E times 4 pi r squared. And then the Q in close is just the entire Q of the sphere. So I just put Q. And then I would touch that up and solve for E. Okay. The graph in this particular setup. Okay. That looks like this. So this expression linear at r equals zero we have zero electric field it rises to the one power so we have a straight line up and i put proportional to r again for the reasons i explained before i could plug in capital r in this formula to see what that transition value is and that's what it is right there q over four pi epsilon zero r squared and then after that this formula takes over if i were to solve i'd see it's proportional to one over r squared so there's a graph Okay, now suppose I wanted to find the potential or the voltage. If you just say potential and not potential difference, what they're asking for if they say that is the voltage from infinity in. That's what voltage potential is defined as. Remember I said voltage is always from an initial final it's between two prongs. There has to be a starting point and end point, like when you plug something into an outlet. Okay, so what is the voltage if we just say V? One prong of the voltage is on at r equals infinity, the other at the particular point you want to find the voltage at. So that means v is minus the integral from initial, which is infinity, into r. And so let's suppose I wanted to find the voltage or the potential at the origin. I didn't write that out, but that's what I'm doing here. So what I do is I have to realize that I'm actually uh, doing two integrals because I have an expression out here and a different one here. So I have to integrate all the way in, but I have to split that integral into one from infinity to capital R, minus infinity to R of the outer electric field, minus picking up the R integration from here, from capital R into zero of the inner expression. So I evaluate all this and get an answer that would be the voltage at the center. Again, no details today, just looking at that um, the main idea is here. All right. Our second example, the hollow sphere. So this time we're looking at uh, plus Q, but it's not spread all the way throughout. There's a hole that's carved in the middle of the sphere and the Q is only confined to this region of capital R, inner radius, capital 2R outer radius. That's what I mean by all that. I don't want to write it out because I don't want to cram up the notes with just words. So let's suppose I'm finding the electric field inside this charge region between capital R and capital 2R. So right there. I realize again I need it because this is spherical I need a Gaussian sphere so I draw a Gaussian sphere there that green uh, uh, sphere there cross section. I start my Solution by writing out Gauss's law with all the little details. The left side, E times area of a sphere. That's what that integral becomes. Okay, and then the Q and close. This is going to be the most challenging thing we're going to look at today. How do you get the Q and close inside this Gaussian sphere? What I need to do is multiply rho times volume. The coulombs per meter cube times the meter cube gives us the coulombs inside there. So the way to get the charge density rho is to take the total charge and divide by the total volume. The total volume where the charge is is 4 thirds pi 2r cubed. That gives me the volume of this entire sphere including the hole. But the charge isn't in the hole so I have to subtract off the volume of the hole 4 thirds pi r cubed. And that's just the volume of this shaded part, this expression. Total charge over total volume, where the charge is. That's rho. The volume of the charge that's inside our Gaussian sphere is the volume of the Gaussian sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. 
That's including the hole. But we got to subtract off the hole because there's no charge there. So we subtract off 4 thirds pi capital R cubed. So that's the setup rho times volume of the charge inside of our Gaussian sheet. All over epsilon zero. And then again, we just do our, you know, divide things over and solve for E. I'm not going to look at the details. Also, I'm not going to look at the other regions. I just wanted to look at this one because this is the most difficult. Another example for spheres is uh, this one. Let's suppose I've got a point charge plus Q. Well, that's not really drawn as a point charge, but I wanted you to be able to see it. So I drew it a little bit bigger, but there's the point charge in the middle plus Q and then a hollow shell that has the minus three cubed charge spread evenly over throughout the shell. The shell has a radius, inner radius of capital R, and then an outer radius of capital 2R. So that's my, you know, lazy if, or quote efficient way to write out all those details. And let's suppose I'm just want to, I just want to find the electric field, not within these regions, which would be a lot of, you know, analysis, just outside of this shell at two uh, at a region r greater than 2r so out here so again i realized that i have a spherical symmetry i need a spherical gaussian surface right so i draw a cross section of the sphere there with a blue circle and then again i write out gauss's law nicely with all the details so i get all my full credit in there right the left side just becomes e times area again as i said before this Q and close is actually much easier. I just take the positive Q minus the negative 3Q, and that's it. So the point of this example is to remember that when you have spheres within spheres or cylinders within cylinders, you're going to have to do addition and subtraction in addition to row times volume as in the previous examples. Okay, so that's all. And then you just divide 4 pi r squared to get the electric field. So that is a little for uh, a couple examples for spherical symmetry. Okay. okay, obviously we haven't looked at everything they could throw at you, but again, we're just trying to get the thinking behind these things refreshed. The last symmetry, planar symmetry. Okay, so the first example I'm gonna do is uh, a parallel plate capacitor. I've got one sheet of charge and another sheet of charge, and as you know with capacitors, they have uh, for parallel plate, they have a certain areas, okay, and a certain amount of charge, a positive charge on the top plate, a negative charge on the bottom plate. And I want to find the electric field inside the plate, uh, uh, this capacitor. Of course, this capacitor area, the plates are much larger than what I'm showing because we need them to be infinite or approximately infinite for our geometry or our scale involved for Gauss's law to give us meaningful results. So we start off again by, so, okay, first thing, we real, I, you have to realize that with a plane, the symmetry is not a sphere, okay? It's not, well, actually you could use a cylinder if you orient it that way, but, you know, I'm gonna, I use the box, okay? Box or cylinder, as long as the cylinder is not this way, but that way, cylinder would work also. But here's a box, and um, you write out, once you write, you envision your Gauss's, Gaussian surface, or you might have to sketch this on a test, you know, sometimes they say sketch a Gaussian surface, then you write out Gauss's law again, and you realize that, well, I'll put this up here, that the flux, this integral, will only be non-zero on this bottom surface. The top surface, this positive create, plate creates an electric field pointing away from it, and the negative creates an electric field pointing toward it. So principal superposition of the electric fields, the electric field net here is zero. We got positive and negative, so no flux through the top, only through the bottom. The positive creates an electric field pointing away from it, in other words, down. The negative towards it, in other words, down. So the two electric fields add, and then we have only flux through the bottom surface. That's what you have to, you do have to know that and realize that for the Gauss's Law uh, analysis to work. So I just have E, at the bottom times the area of our Gaussian surface. By the way, I would put that little g there because if you just put e times area, you have an inconsistency with the area of the plate in your diagram. Clearly, this is not the area of the plate. Where it, but if you put a 
without a Gaussian subscript here, you're saying E times area of the entire plate is the flux through that little surface there. Technically not correct. If you left it off, would the AP graders take points off? Probably not. But I'm just, you know, showing you technically you do, those, those are different areas. That area and that area are not the same. Okay, so the uh, uh, Q enclosed up here, okay, is sigma times area. Sigma being the coulombs per meter squared. The coulombs per meter squared, the charge density, is the total charge over the total area of the plate. That's sigma times the area of our Gaussian cross-section of our Gaussian surface would give you the Q inside of our box over epsilon zero. The Gaussian areas drop away and you basically get an expression of electric field that's constant. Okay, So that's one example, the parallel plate capacitor. Okay, Final. Okay. The slab. Okay, this is a cross section of a slab. Imagine that you have like the asphalt or the concrete of a parking lot, and that has a thickness. And somehow, maybe if it's concrete, you inject a charge all throughout the concrete. So there's a certain charge density, a certain coulombs per meter cubed, and the slab has a certain thickness d. If we define a z-coordinate as zero in the middle, that makes this positive d over two and negative d over two because the whole slab is d thick. So two different regions, we want to find the electric field within the slab at d over two and outside greater than d over two. So less than d over two, greater than d over two. Now, you have actually a couple different options. First of all, you have to realize that we need a box in this case. So because this plane has that kind of general symmetry, planar symmetry. So here's a cross section of a box in green. This is another possibility you could have picked for a Gaussian box. But I picked this one. Why does it straddle z equals zero? I can't have this at a different distance, at a different z coordinate, because I can't have two electric field values at, at the top and bottom. Basically, from the thinking about this, you should be able to visualize and use your distributed charge knowledge to reason out that the electric field is zero at z equals zero, because we have equal charge above and below that z equals zero line. So the electric field pointing away and away cancel at the center. The further you go out, the more electric field you have, so it's going to increase as you're going out. You have to know that even before you start the Gaussian uh, uh, analysis. So I can pick a box like this where I have E here and E here that are the same, or like this where I have E equals zero and then the only one E here that I'm solving for. But I picked this one. So again, I write out Gauss's law, okay? And then basically, I see that the flux will only be through the top and bottom, E at the top area of the Gaussian surface, times E at the bottom area of the Gaussian surface. These are actually the same E, so I don't even need those subscripts there, but I just put them there so you kind of better, for better understanding. The Q enclosed, I colored in pink over here, and that's going to be rho times volume, the volume of that box, which is the area of the bottom, the area of the Gaussian surface, times 2z. Well, there's one z, and there's another z, so two z tall here. So, area times height, volume of the Gaussian box, times the charge density, gives us the coulombs inside, all over epsilon zero. Again, I didn't show you the details of solving, because we're just looking at the highlights. So, this just becomes 2ea equals that. You see that the a's go away, and so on and so forth, you solve for the e. All right, outside the box, I mean outside the slab up here, suppose I want to find the electric field, now I picked this as our Gaussian surface, it basically goes through z equals zero and up here, and so Gauss's law, you write it out, okay, and then you realize that the um, electric field flux is only going to be through the top, so E times area, that's the flux through the top right there, 
And then the Q in close is row times volume, area times height, but only up to here, the portion colored in yellow, because uh, there's no charge up here, right? So I have to just find the volume of that yellow region shaded there. So area times D over 2 gives you the volume of that times the row gives you the coulombs. And again, you solve for E. The last thing, they might ask you to graph the electric field. And in order to do that, you would realize that this expression gives you a linear function with respect to Z, so straight line, straight line, because the electric field down here will point down, up here will point up. So uh, that's why we have negative electric field below Z equals zero and positive. And then once we get out here, if you look at this formula, there's no Z dependence. You solve for E and you get a constant electric field. Okay, so that's constant. And then I put in the values there, D over two. So that's the graph, okay? So that is Gauss's law. Again, I want to re-emphasize that this is a very popular topic on the free response. You want to go back, look at these nodes, study all the different geometries. I'm also going to include in the stream uh, that worksheet that I had, had included when we studied Gauss's law that has all these second lines you know, written out for different scenarios. So you could practice creating those second lines and the thinking, again, that's the heart of the problem. But again, I'm showing you highlights. Doesn't mean the AP didn't think of some kind of curveball to throw at you. But we can't prepare for that, right? We just prepare by realizing the logic behind Gauss's law, how it works, studying the basic fundamental problems that show up, the more straightforward ones, so we get ready, and hopefully the, te the, the question they picked on Gauss's Law, if they picked one, is a straightforward problem. If it's one of the curveball ones, well, at least now you have the thinking behind Gauss's Law. The dot products, the electric field DA, this closed integral, Q and close, and hopefully you'll be able to figure out what, uh, what to do on such a problem. So again, here's what we studied, the concept. Cylindrical symmetry, spherical symmetry, planar symmetry, the basic setups behind Gauss's law. Okay, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next review video.